to introduce Tom Zadowinski, who is a um, expert on fuel cells, to tell us about those opportunities um, this morning. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Nancy. Good morning. Um, uh, I was asked to speak about electrochemical uh, or energy storage in general. Um, I, as an electrochemist uh, of sorts, I thought I'd uh, uh, do two things to the topic, talk about electrochemical energy storage and actually add conversion. Um, and then finally a little tagline because in fact, uh, as uh, I'm sure you know, uh, you all have batteries, uh, have been using batteries for a long time, um, maybe not so much fuel cells. But uh, in fact, uh, these are, <coughs> excuse me, old and well-developed technologies. Why are we interested in them again? Well, uh, that's, that's part of the story. Uh, but in fact, there's been kind of a, uh, a very strong change in uh, the mode of uh, development that was spearheaded, in fact, by the fuel cell side of things. Batteries, uh, if, if any of you, uh, I know some people here uh, are involved in it, the battery, the battery field is a very empirical field. Um, fuel cells were one of these uh, rare fields that developed, you know, sort of uh, in, in an organic way from things that we learned often in the laboratory, not just uh, through building things in industry. Um, so there's a very interesting uh, dichotomy there. So again, electrochemical energy storage and conversion equals fuel cells and batteries. I also happen to be uh, thrust leader for uh, 10 score, our Tennessee EPS score. Um, and before you hiss about things, I didn't wear anything orange. I have no, no uh, skin in this game, although they were speculating that the, or that the uh, uh, bleeding fountains were uh, bleeding, bleeding orange yesterday, but not quite. All right. <clears throat> Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are aware of the uh, uh, interesting things that are happening with electric vehicles these days, and that is uh, heavily driven by batteries. There's one big problem. The battery that we're all familiar with that's great for your flashlight isn't necessarily a great thing for your car. And in fact, uh, uh, some of the uh, growing pains, let's say, of the uh, pure electric vehicle uh, industry uh, have been uh, well publicized, things like uh, fires and the so-called uh, introduction of the term brick, bricking, uh, namely your battery goes completely dead uh, when you thought you had plenty of charge in it, and so on. Um, however, batteries, uh, there's a lot of interest right now because of the um, intermittency of uh, renewable energy sources such as wind and solar, uh, and, our, and some focus on uh, the electric grid, and stabilizing it in, in various ways of having uh, large-scale batteries for grid energy storage. I'll talk about that most extensively as, as we go forward. And then finally, fuel cells, uh, hmm, a little interesting PowerPoint glitch there. Um, fuel, fuel cells are, uh, as Nancy mentioned, something that I personally have spent about 25 years of my life working on, um, wh whether they're for electric vehicles, station stationary applications, or portable power. Um, there's different, uh, different aspects of these things, and I want you to stop thinking about batteries and fuel cells and start thinking about a continuum, because in fact we're going to fill in the middle of the continuum, uh, at least partly in a minute. But a battery is, stri is strictly speaking, the standard uh, thinking about it is that it's an energy storage device that contains all its reactants. Uh, so basically if you have some waste product, you're carrying it around for the life of the battery. Uh, that tends to create a large divisor. Uh, which is weight, when ta people talk about the uh, most important figure of merit of uh, uh, specific energy density or specific power density. Specific means divide by weight, uh, trivially, and so uh, they, batteries can be heavy. Meanwhile, fuel cells ex uh, reactants are externally supplied. So a fuel cell plus a tank, if you will, a tank of something, fuel specifically, is a, is a, a battery. Uh, equivalent. Um, the advantage that fuel cells uh, tend to have is that they convert these reagents rather than carry around the waste products. And furthermore, they don't even carry around the reagents all the time. They may, uh, most often, uh, fuel cells will use air electrodes. Um, and so you don't, since, since all you're doing is carrying around a small amount of catalyst, that divisor that I talked about uh, can be very favorable. Um, here's some more ways of thinking about things. Battery materials evolve during use. 
Um, after all, you can only stuff lithium ions in, in, into and out of uh, and pull them out of a lattice so many times before that lattice starts to, to uh, pulverize sometimes or, or, or evolve, let's say. Um, the fuel cell device, as I mentioned, is a converter, and so uh, our durability issues are different, totally different from those of batteries in, in many respects. It's basically how well our catalysts stay active, whether they get poisoned, et cetera, et cetera. Charge and discharge in a battery is slow. It's pretty much on the same time scale as the, uh, or, or having to recharge your battery for the same amount of time as, as you discharge it is, is uh, an issue that uh, may be the killer for battery-powered electric vehicles, strictly battery-powered electrical vehicles. Uh, whereas uh, in, in a fuel cell, charge and discharge are the equivalent of filling a tank, which we all are very familiar with because we do it with our gasoline power. Um, cars. Battery, again, is an energy storage device, and a fuel cell is an engine. And so the important thing there is we're all, uh, we also th know about the hybrid electric vehicle model. And in fact, you're going to use both fuel cells and batteries in any purely electric vehicle that's based on fuel cells. So right away, I'm telling you, it's not either or. Uh, it's both and, you know, and in, in many cases, uh, it, we live in a world uh, where what Diedrich talked about uh, happening at NSF really does happen at DOE when funding for one goes up, the funding for the other goes down. It's like sitting on a balloon. Um, but these devices look exactly the same inside except for details of chemistry, which is kind of interesting for us. Okay, so here's the recent de development directions, and the idea is to give you a flavor of what's happening right now in the world. Um, batteries for electric vehicles, a really major issue is the range of the of the cars uh, or of the yeah of the cars um, it's today focused on lithium ion technology although there's plenty of nickel metal hydride batteries out there um, there's a strong need for greater energy density and that translates to range per weight obviously uh, you have to pull the battery along with the car uh, as well and so uh, weight is a very important factor volume also a very big factor uh, um, and those things tend to correlate um, so they need, you need greater capacity. You need every battery to store more energy. Um, people, that, that has implications uh, for what is built, specifically things like thicker electrodes and so on and so forth. You need a uh, longer cycling lifetime. And the cycling, again, for these batteries is very different from the, um, uh, from, from the typical cycling that you will have in a flat, uh, in, even in a rechargeable, battery like that in your computer. Um, you need better chemical stability. Uh, lithium batteries blow up and catch on fire whether we like it or not. Um, no matter how many controllers people put on them, they seem to manage to burn down a factory that contains a measurable percent of the world's supply of lithium ion batteries every year. Um, and we need faster rates. Batteries are not high rate devices. Uh, the currents that are drawn from a typical battery are uh, you know, sort of two to three orders of magnitude lower than we're used to in fuel cells um, per, on a per square centimeter basis. So again, emerging technologies, um, people really have talked a lot about lithium air batteries. Uh, we can go back, if you will, to lithium metal batteries, which uh, the lithium metal side, half of the lithium air couple. The problem with lithium air batteries, uh, there's basically three major problems with them. The anode, the cathode, and the electrolyte. Uh, which is basically the entire battery. Uh, lithium air batteries are very difficult, represent a very difficult series of problems. I uh, have colleagues who work on these who like to use titles like take the worst of the fuel cell and the worst, of, worst electrode in the battery and put them together and you've got a lithium air battery, let's go for it. Or uh, thing, things like that. Um, there's a lot of hype about this. Uh, and uh, basically, I, my read on them is that the uh, lithium air batteries are really kind of at the stage where we were 20 years ago for fuel cells. Um, in the middle of this continuum are batteries for electric grid energy storage. These are, uh, my favorite flavor of these are, are redox flow batteries. You can build gigantic batteries, uh, sodium sulfur batteries and even gigantic lithium ion batteries. A lithium ion battery that is as big as a trailer is nothing more to me than a bomb waiting to go off or a terrorist target. It's a real big problem uh, from my perspective. And if you talk to the electric utilities, uh, as I have, uh, back when I was in Ohio, we sat down with AEP 
and uh, talked about safety. And their attitude is, if it can explode, it or it will eventually on the grid. And again, create uh, ca uh, putting uh, a megawatt worth of lithium batteries all together is a real recipe for disaster. Um, these redox flow batteries have a slightly different configuration, and it's actually halfway between a fuel cell and a battery. So you store the reagents externally and flow them into a converter. So you independently actually uh, uh, size, if you will, the power, the size of the converter, and the energy, the size of the tank that can contains reagents. Okay? Uh, there's some really neat attributes, but I like to talk to people and say, imagine a battery the size of a Home Depot. That's what we're talking about here. Uh, as a matter of fact, it may be that, that you have modular sub, sub modules of these things, and maybe I've, I saw one recently uh, that's very well packaged of a particular technology that's about 15 kilowatts in a crate, in a, in a sort of a big box that would be st uh, put all together, each having their own little tank. But again, um, this is the core of the technology. Once again, by the way, I didn't put it here, but this is courtesy of my buddies at Electrosynthesis. Um, convenient uh, web meme now for for uh, flow batteries, but in fact you have again electrolytes in two tanks uh, or more perhaps uh, or fewer perhaps depending on the chemistry you use, um, and you flow them in and they get and, and they get interconverted. I'll show you a little bit uh, uh, of a, a, a video, if you will, of that in in a minute. Um, and of course, power electronics are very important. You have a few pumps that you don't have in a normal battery. So when you start thinking about the system, of course, you have to start thinking about uh, the uh, ancillary components as well in terms of their efficiency. However, from a, uh, as, as uh, systems go, they have uh, potential for very low cost. They have inherent scalability. I kind of just illustrated that quickly. Uh, they're very efficient. You can get up to on the order of 90% round trip uh, 80 to 90 percent round trip efficiency, although that's not necessarily the point where people will operate them, I'm learning. Um, they, uh, th this is based again on that converter technology that I talked about for fuel cells, except it's actually quite a bit simpler uh, in that uh, you don't, have, for example, use nanoparticles of precious metal to do your catalysis necessarily, and so uh, that tends to be one of the biggest uh, uh, degrader, things that degrade in fuel cells, and so uh, but we still know that fuel cells are projected to 15,000 type hour lifetimes, which is a pretty, pretty good uh, uh, period of time. It's almost 20 years, in fact. Um, and then finally, I, I emphasize safety. Uh, this is, uh, these are often, as I'll tell you in a second, aqueous solutions uh, here. Um, that's actually uh, a plus and a minus, but from a safety perspective, it's a, a, a clear plus. Uh, in terms of the uh, l lack of very super high energy density storage of all the reagents together um, by separating them in these tanks. Okay, uh, there's many types of flow, ba flow batteries. There's the all vanadium battery, which we've used as sort of a, uh, a starting point in our work. Uh, iron chrome, iron cerium, zinc bromine, hydrogen bromine, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's several new players, especially those using air electrodes. I mentioned lithium air, but there's aluminum air, zinc air, uh, type batteries that, uh, if they're made rechargeable, can, can work. Note that they have several characteristics. Simple inorganic redox couples tend to be cheap, tend to be electrochemically reversible, therefore uh, not killing you on efficiency. And simple, usually aqueous electrolytes. I want to go back for a second. Oops. And, and show you and, and remind you about the size of this tank. You know, I have. Uh, Colleagues, and in fact, I, I sometimes think myself, uh, having done my PhD in this area, about ionic liquid-based batteries or non-aqueous-based batteries. Um, well, there's not enough ionic liquid in the world to fill that tank, and uh, bluntly, uh, if there, even if there was, it would cost you. You can't get cheaper than water and sulfuric acid, which is usually the electrolyte. Uh, but a ionic liquid is a good way to make it a lot more expensive. Same with almost any non-aqueous solvent. And you mitigate, uh, for example, if you use acetonitrile or any of the common amides that uh, you know, have high dissolving power or whatever, you will uh, uh, create extra safety problems, once again, because they often are volatile and degrade and so on and so forth. So um, generally, 
You need a good re voltage separation of two, two redox couples, that's about it. That energy density depends strong, of course, on the, directly on the voltage difference and also on how much of it you can pack into a solution. That's another uh, mistake that a lot of the non-aqueous and or molten salt people make. Uh, people rarely use the actual molten salt species as the carrier, but rather use it as a straight solvent, which is a very heavy and expensive uh, solvent to put a tiny bit of lithium into a uh, into an ionic liquid, and it just doesn't make sense. You can use complexation and other tricks. I went to a uh, colleague who's a real expert on uh, um, complexation at uh, Oak Ridge. Uh, builds all sorts of interesting ligands to do complexation. I said, oh, we can control the voltage very nicely, et cetera, et cetera. He said, well, why would you want to do that? You're just going to make it more expensive and uh, less soluble. Uh, interesting perspective. Uh, I was offering a guy, you know, joining in and getting some funding or something <laughs> like that, and oh well. Um, and cost is clearly an issue. Uh, basically, uh, our competition is not other flow batteries or other battery technologies, but it's uh, gas, uh, gas turbines. It's um, hyd uh, pumped hydro. Of course, that's somewhat limited. Compressed air energy storage. So uh, we are right from the beginning very uh, strongly sensitive to that. So here's, here's a little bit about a redox flow battery, a vanadium one we're, we're going to talk about. I call this in the immortal words of, uh, uh, immortal phrase of um, uh, Alfred Hitchcock, the MacGuffin for our work, because in fact it's what's starting the action. Um, and basically uh, we have two electrodes uh, uh, surrounding a, a separator or an electrolyte, typically an ion exchange membrane. Um, and basically, we start, uh, we feed vanadium-2 and vanadium-5 during discharge of the battery, and lo and behold, we create vanadium-4 and vanadium-3, and colors change. Vanadium's really colorful chemistry, uh, four different oxidation states. Here's what we're doing at Oak Ridge uh, on this. We're really trying to focus on increasing the power density using lessons we learned from fuel cells. Um, we're lowering, in light of that, we're looking to lower the aerospecific resistance and uh, we're starting to implement a durability program to understand these things. But our real goal is improving performance and providing diagnostics. Two minutes, wow, I gotta hurry. So we've gone uh, about, we've, we've managed in, in several steps to improve uh, the power density of these things over the last year and a half by about a factor of 10. Um, increasing this power density mostly requires engineering, uh, including internal resistance, mass transfer, things like that. The, uh, the real opportunity is improving the chemistry, as I talked with Steve for about two seconds about uh, earlier, um, using air electrodes. As I mentioned, air is free in a sense, metal electrodes, multivalent species. There's a lot of ways to work on this and a lot of opportunities um, in fuel cells for, uh, to quickly shift gears. The cost has been a real, a real driver. You're going to see fuel cells on the road uh, in, in 2015, much like you saw the first hybrid vehicles some time ago, um, and the cost, uh, costs are coming down. Right now, I think DOE says it's about $49 per kilowatt uh, installed at, at high volume. That's pretty good, um, and in fact, uh, you know, is enough definitely to launch vehicles. Um, re research we're doing, I'm gonna have to go fast over, uh, over this. I'm showing this for the wonks in the audience who like catalysis. We're making various platinum nanotubes and organometallic complexes. Back to our battery and fuel cell comparison, the real important things are here. Uh, basically, mo almost all car companies, uh, though they've embraced batteries because they were bribed to do so uh, effectively uh, for battery electric vehicles, fuel cell vehicles today, today, have range at least 300 miles uh, in a, essentially a production, uh, a van that you would re not recognize as any different uh, from a Chevy van uh, or a Toyota van. Uh, right now. Um, um, again, higher low T degrades this, but uh, not quite as badly as for these. The recharge time is a real killer, up to eight hours, basically, if you drive for eight hours. Here it's, of course, three to five minutes, because you're, uh, if you use hydrogen as a fuel. Um, cost is, costs are going to be similar um, with subsidies and so on. Lots of opportunities for chemists, and that's what I am, so I thought I'd throw that in here. A few general ideas. Um, improving the electrolytes for voltage stability, new nanostructures. Um, the, this flow battery has a lot to, lot to go. I want to close, <laughs> uh, other than acknowledgments, with 
Um, new tech, uh, a comment on hype and new technologies. This is a slide from the Gartner Group that I love and I usually use in um, sort of uh, public audiences. Um, basically, it shows uh, something like uh, what Diedrich was talking about with the valley of death and so on, but it's for, for emerging technology. If something happens in the lab and you start to get a, a trigger, people get all excited about it and you reach a uh, peak of inflated expectations. Um, this is usually when the IPOs are, are trying to happen. Um, and then the uh, basically hard reality hits in, things drop, and you get the trough of disillusionment afterwards. Um, slowly, so, uh, those of us who are uh, uh, you know, knowledgeable in the field will keep at it, and you'll have a slow, steady slope of enlightenment before you actually uh, introduce things. So uh, we've gone through this in fuel cells. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, hopefully we're on the on the path to productivity. But uh, I just want to give my my contact information and talk about Tennessee EPSCOR. I tried to make orange and blue. Uh, lots of ways we can collaborate, and I will stop with that. Thank you very much.